unit in the war had like an Italian in it and a Jew and a Pole, and you know, that, that's, what the, that's what the army did, is it brought all these people together and made them Americans. That's what the war did. That's what growing up in the South End did, actually, because the South End was a melting pot like that, too. It had, everyone in the neighborhood was the child of an immigrant, right? Everyone who grew up there, your parents could be from, you know, Romania or Poland, it didn't matter. Everyone sort of grew up together. But something happened in the 1940s at the end of the war. Um, so this new opening happened with the Middle East. Lebanon gained its independence. And that generation of people who fought in World War II or who grew up in that period, they started looking around. You know, when they drove to the South End from their neighborhoods in Detroit where they lived or other parts of the metropolitan area, they drove down Woodward Avenue. They drove down Michigan Avenue and they saw big churches, big, big, big Roman Catholic parishes and Protestant churches and Jewish synagogues. And they thought, this, this Hashmi Hall thing, uh, the coal mine, you know, because the soot in the neighborhood was so bad, the windows were always covered in soot. Or they used to call the Dick's Mosque the basement. You know, it's, these aren't mosques. You know, we want a mosque. We want something we can be proud of like these Christian churches are. So one thing they did, they also wanted someone who could really teach the next generation. They were worried that their kids were losing their Arabic. So uh, uh, they sent back to Lebanon, basically, for a scholar to come here and join them in America. And that scholar was Imam Shib, who I'm sure all of you know. The Albanian community was doing the same thing at the same time. They, Imam Wahbi and Imam Shiri arrived at the same time. They were both wonderful scholars. They both did a lot to revolutionize the practice of Islam in America. So uh, again, this is what Hashmi Hall looked like. Uh, Imam Shiri, as long as that's not the Adam. I, I spoke on Sunday at a mosque and the Adam went off in the middle of my, uh, my talk and I got in trouble with the Imam because nobody went to pray. So. That wasn't on me. <laughs> um, anyway, so when Imam, when Imam Shiri came to Detroit, one of the first things he did in Hashmi Hall was he had a big hafli at Hashmi Hall, and he put a rug down, a big green rug. He rolled it out on the floor of the mosque, and he said, I declare this a mosque. Wow. This was, you know, 12 years after the mosque had opened. <coughs> a few weeks later, he had a similar ceremony where he announced the opening of a school at Hashmi Hall, which they'd also been teaching Arabic and teaching Islam for several years, right? So he, people weren't really happy with this. He didn't speak English. He said that what he wanted to do was sort of bring a new knowledge, new education to the, to the American-born generation, but he didn't speak English. So as all of you know, I'm sure, he got kicked out of Dearborn. He went to Michigan City. While he was in Michigan City, he didn't waste his time. He learned English. He said the second thing that he learned, the most valuable thing he said other than learning English was learning that women run the mosque. So when he came back to Detroit, he was a different kind of leader. He was, in, uh, so yeah, the American Muslim Society was also growing in this period. This is their, their construction that took place in the 1950s, so it was no longer just a basement. Now it was a, you know, a much nicer, grander mosque, it looked like a mosque. That's Imam Karub in the picture. Uh, this is what it looked like inside. He had always wanted it to be Masjid al Am and not just, uh, not just the, the Baka club, you know. And in this picture, there are a lot of Lebanese, there are Indians, there are Turks in the picture. Um, but this is another thing that happened. This happened nationally, not just, here, not just here in Detroit. The Federation of Islamic Associations of the U.S. and Canada got started in this period. And this was a very progressive national organization. The goal was for them to unify the Muslim community of America. A lot of the people who had fought in World War II, if you fought World War II, you had to have you had to pick when you went into the army. Were you going to have Christian dog tags, Jewish dog tags? Well, you had Protestant, Catholic, Jew, and atheist. Those were your options. So you had to pick one of those. So if you were killed in battle, you would be buried according to that tradition. So the guys who had fought in the war, when they came home, they said, this is no longer good enough. We want the government to recognize our religion. So this was one of the main reasons they organized the Federation. They also, it was, a, it was a, this, this is the year they had their banquet in Detroit, 1957. Um, they also wanted to provide a curriculum for American kids to, to study Arabic and to, you know, have good, you know, Sunday school textbooks in their mosques. And uh, they wanted a chance for people from small communities so their kids could know each other and they could marry other Muslims. And they also were upset about what happened in 1948 in Palestine. So they were upset at the role America played in not sort of challenging Israel. So again, 
They didn't turn their back on their religion. They didn't turn their back on their politics. They didn't turn their back on their families. These were the things that were motivating the community in this period. So when they had the banquet in Detroit in 1957, the main keynote speaker was Muhammad Jawad Shuli. And he spoke in English. And he gave an impressive sermon, something like no one had heard before in Detroit. And so that young delegation of men and women from Dearborn in Detroit got in their cars and drove to Michigan City and convinced Imam Shuri to come back here. This is a story you all know. Started the Islamic Center of America. That's what it looked like in 1962 on their opening day. Big crowd. Not exactly what people look like, especially women in mosques. Don't necessarily dress like that anymore. Um, but so what was happening in this period is because of this period where we hadn't had immigration, uh, there was a real move. We had the Civil Rights Act, which passed in 1964. We had the Voting, Voting Rights Act, which passed in 1965. So America was becoming more uh, self-critical in terms of its racial history and self-critical in terms of its, just its religious bigotry. So we were trying to promote the idea of pluralism. A lot of this came from World War II again. And there was a third part to that. They, they call the Immigration Act, which passed in 1965, they call it the third part of the American Civil Rights Act. Because what it was, is it was the children of those Catholic immigrants, the Poles, the Italians, all those people whose families had been cut off from new immigration. They felt like the immigration law discriminated against them very specifically. They didn't change the immigration law to let in more Arabs. <laughs> that isn't what they did, or to let in Asians. They changed it because so many ethnic white Americans felt discriminated against. But in 1965, we had a new, uh, new immigration law, and it incredibly transformed the, the, the nation that we live in. I mean, it obviously transformed the city that we live in, but it certainly did the nation. So we had um, just a huge uptick in the number of people. We allowed 20% of the visas in this early period to come from those parts of the world that we had really had a total bar on. So that basically means Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So there was like a favoritism, actually, for people coming from this period. You also had new laws that allowed for people to bring their children in, their dependents in. We also had new laws that allowed for the settlement of refugees. At the time, the refugees we were really concerned about were the anti-communist refugees. So family reunification, you know, so on and so forth, students. So all these things, as we know, really changed the face of the Arab American community because it just so happened that that immigration law changed two years before the 1967 war. It changed two years before the Civil War, you know, how many years? Eight years before the Civil War got started in Lebanon. We've had one war. So the big difference between the early immigrants who came is they came looking for economic opportunity. So many of the people who have come after 1965 came directly because of war. They've been either refugees or people who came here because they had family here and they had, the, they had access to a visa. So it's been a real difference between the early period and the more recent period. But again, these institutions were going along about their merry way. They were American institutions. I love these pictures. This is uh, uh, Miriam Elwan's wedding uh, at the Islamic Center of America. Uh, here's Khalil Bezi giving a lecture to the mosque. I love this picture because he's lecturing and Imam Shiri sitting quietly in front of him. But these institutions were growing and changing. Um, but the, the, so here, you know, some of the political causes. So still in the 1960s and 70s, the thing that drew people to Detroit specifically was the auto industry. There were jobs here. Um, in the 70s, really in 73, 74, we had the oil embargo and that started to really change, change the economy of the area. Um, uh, we also had in this period, you know, because of the 73 war, the UAW here in Michigan bought Israeli war bonds. Um, and so the Arab workers got together and they petitioned the UAW to get rid of their, their war bonds. The UAW said, we're not going to listen to you, you're a small faction, we don't care. Uh, so what they did was they had a, a, the organization of Arab students, this African American uh, workers' movement, the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement, supported the Arab workers, and they created something called the Arab Workers' Caucus, which basically shut down the Dodge main factory in protest over these war bonds. So it's mostly Yemeni workers, Palestinian workers, some Lebanese workers. So I'm mentioning Yemenis and Palestinians, which tells you the community wasn't just Lebanese anymore, it wasn't just Syrians anymore, it was starting to diversify too. 
Uh, so this was a big moment for the community. The, the, the UAW sold like a third of their Israeli war bonds, not very many, it was just a gesture that they made. And they deported a lot of the Yemenis who were there working. So it was a, a Pyrrhic victory for the Arab community, but still people thought that, you know, it really brought people together around this political issue. You also had at this time here in Dearborn, and this is, this is also like a really important moment for the way Dearborn looks today and how the city of Dearborn grew. So that South End neighborhood where the two mosques were, where the Lebanese were, where the Arabs really were all coming because those Palestinians and Yemenis, they wanted to be near the mosque. They wanted to be near the grocery stores where people spoke Arabic and where they could get you know, all the ingredients that they wanted from home. Um, but the mayor of Dearborn didn't like the South End. The South End was where all those radicals had been who were opposed to the UAW back in the early days. The South End of Dearborn was where the poor people lived who were always complaining about city services. The South End, as you all know, many of you might have never been to the South End. I have students today who have never been to the South End of Dearborn. I'm like, how can that be? <laughs> that's, the, that's the birthplace of your community. Um, but the South End um, had all that pollution that I talked about before from the factory. It was hard to keep it clean. It was hard to provide services. And it happened to be separating the Ford Motor Company from the Levy Asphalt Company, which was just across the border in Detroit, and which had a deal that it had worked out with Ford where it was making slags. So all the byproducts of the steel production were going straight to Levy. He was using them to make roads. So anyway, Ford and Levy, a lot of other people, Mayor Hubbard, got together and they decided to rezone the South End for industry. They started seizing people's homes illegally, tearing them down. Uh, 350 homes were destroyed in, a, in the first period. Another period, we had lost another 200 homes. And this was all happening right at the time when there was war in the Middle East. So people were coming, people were feeling like really um, upset and frustrated and angry about what was happening overseas. And they were turning on the news and they were seeing all that stuff about the oil embargo and this new you know, anti-Arab sentiment that was rising in American society. And here the, the mayor was trying to get rid of their neighborhood. So as it winds up, it was the Arabs, it was Ron Amon's mom, Catherine Amon, who actually, you know, worked with the Southeast Dearborn Community Council to file a suit against the city. And it was that Amon versus the city of Dearborn lawsuit that saved the South End from the wrecking ball. And again, this happened just as all these new people were coming, all these new immigrants were coming. It was also this moment where you had, you know, all these national organizations, the, um, American Arab University Graduates, Association of Arab American University Graduates, started in 1967 right after the